This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your hosts, Chris Spear and Andrew Wilkinson. Each week, we'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org and on Facebook and Instagram at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. This is episode 22 of the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. On this week's episode, we have Kathy Barrow. She's a writer, recipe developer, cookbook author, and pie maker. Her books include Mrs. Wheelbarrow's Practical Pantry, Pie Squared, and her most recent book is called When Pies Fly. Kathy came on the show to talk a little bit about writing cookbook proposals and making pie. We hope you enjoy this episode. And once again, Thank you to Jug Bridge Brewery, located at 911 East Patrick Street in Frederick, Maryland. Thanks, and have a great week. Hello. We're back with the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I'm Andrew. And this is Chris. And today on the show, we have Kathy Barrow. Did I say that correctly? Nope, it's Barrow. Barrow, I'm sorry. (laughs) That's okay. Kathy Barrow. Uh, Kathy is a writer. She has several books. She's an expert pie maker. She is a columnist for the Washington Post, and probably many other things, but I guess I'll let you describe that. Tell us a little more about yourself. Yeah, I'm a cookbook author, um, a recipe developer. In food writing, there's a lot of different kind of writing. People tend to ask me, when they hear I'm a writer, they think, what restaurants do you like? Well, I'm a recipe developer and not a restaurant critic, so... I make up my own recipes. And I've been doing that for the last eight years for the Washington Post. And I've written for most of the major food publications um, and three books now. Do you ever consult uh, restaurants or anybody on their recipes? No, I haven't done that so much. But I have taught several restaurant chefs how to preserve. My first book was on preserving. And interestingly, even... The very best pastry schools in the country don't necessarily teach how to make jam. And if you think about how often a smear of raspberry jam goes in between layers of cake, Mm -hmm. it's surprising to me that those pastry chefs come out of school without knowing how to do that. And so several have come to me to learn how to do basic uh, jam making. I've taught pickling and tomato canning to other chefs. So that would be the primary way that I work with chefs. What's that book called? We'll link to it, but I also want to know for myself. It is called Mrs. Wheelbarrow's Practical Pantry. And it's not only jams and jellies and pickles, but also pressure canning, which um, teaches you how to can and uh, store things like chicken stock or dried beans all ready to go. So instead of buying your canned ba- black beans at the grocery store, you get canned black beans right out of your pantry. And it's got a section on preserving meat, so bacon and smoked meats and brisket and things like that, and fish, and then a section on cheese making. So, awesome. I'm going to need that. It's very relevant to me. <laughs> uh, we have so many beautiful tomatoes in the summertime yes. here, and I do pizza, so. Yeah, but I don't seriously. Know I can or anything like it's that. so easy. Yeah. It's so easy. I've written about tomato canning. I don't know, a dozen times probably, because everybody should do it. When we have a good Mm -hmm. tomato season, there's no reason not to put up quarts and quarts of tomatoes to use. Because if you think about how many of those heavy cans of tomatoes as a home cook you carry home every week, just multiply that by 52, and that's how many you should can in the summer. I think it's very daunting. You hear a lot about like botulism and food safety. And I think people get so scared. I know even myself, when I have a ton of tomatoes, I'll just throw them in a Ziploc freezer bag and throw them in kind of hole in the freezer. Because you have a big freezer. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And it it takes up way more space than I'd like. So I would like to get more into canning, but something I haven't even gotten into myself. Okay. I, here's what I have to say about being afraid of it. There are better ways to kill your family than trying to do it with canned tomatoes. Seriously. It is so, it's so rare. It is so rare that anything like that would happen and that you wouldn't see that there was a problem. If, if canning doesn't work, usually you get mold. Botulism is, is an issue of acidity. 
and you can use pH strips if you want to get nervous, but you can also just put some citric acid in the tomatoes and you're done. It's safe. Tomatoes have varying pH, depending on different heirloom varieties, but also the quality of soil, how much rain there is, I mean, all kinds of things. And citric acid just gives you that added ingredient that makes sure that it's safe. So, easy as can be. And you just usually use that in like a powdered form? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, cheap, easy. Yeah. Um, I mean, the biggest problem with canning tomatoes is that it makes an unholy mess. It does. <laughs> That's not a problem. For me, I make a mess anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so which book was your favorite to write? You know, I've, I've loved writing all of them. It's so engrossing to get involved in a book. You're just, your whole brain becomes that book. It's all you think about. You sleep and eat and dream about it. And uh, so the first book was really challenging. It was so new to me. So I had to learn how. And um, in many ways, like my first child, I guess. Mm. It's just that one I'm, I'm very happy and proud of. But the other two have, have reached a broader audience in many ways, and they were a lot of fun to write. Mm. And it wasn't like every page had to be filled with warnings about how you're not going to kill your family. <laughs> you know, nobody worries about that with a pie. Right. So um, for those, two, I just had a good time with all of them, really. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can't pick. So what is like, what's... What's the process of writing a book like this? I mean, does it start with just a, a list of recipes and then you kind of put the story into it? or So it starts with a proposal, and that's okay. the hardest part. Yeah. And people say, oh, spend a lot of time on your proposal because then you've done your work. And that's really true. The proposal mm -hmm. involves your list of recipes, sample recipes, the table of contents, what order do you want to tell them, maybe an introduction. It might not be your final introduction, but it's an introduction to the editors who might be interested in buying the book. And so in that way, it's your sales tool. What's this book about? Why are you writing it? What's your competition? There's a whole section in the proposal about marketing and other books on the topic. And are you different? Are you better? Or did those sell a lot? Has there not been a book like that in many years? So the proposal for my first book took two years. For the next two, it only took about four or five months. But it's not an inconsequential amount of time. It's not like you sit down over the weekend and write a proposal. Because right. that's where you develop your voice. And it's the thing that the editors use to sell your book to their internal people. Like, what makes this book interesting to a publisher? That's where you start. And once that's done, I've been using a really fantastic program called Scrivener. S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R. -E -E and it is an organizing tool for book writing. So mm. uh, it works on any platform, but for me it's very visual. It's folders for each chapter, documents for each recipe. Mm. And the beauty of it is that you can actually move it around physically. And I mean, I started writing my first book in Word. And so when I wanted to move a recipe, I would cut and paste. And we all know the stories of the cut and then the paste that doesn't paste, paste. right? <laughs> yeah. And um, so Scrivener saves me from those moments, which is wonderful. And um, so I work in Scrivener, and then, you know, it's, it takes a long time. It's taken, uh, each of my books took about nine months to write. Mm -hmm. And while you write it, you test the recipes. My recipes are all tested until they're satisfactory and once satisfactory I'll make them three more times to make sure that they work out the same way each time and after that it goes to a recipe tester a professional woman I know in Maine has been testing all of mine and she'll test it three times mm -hmm. and very different maybe different equipment or uh, different periods of time that things rest or don't rest in between and so we get down to a recipe that can be counted on to work the same for absolutely everybody who picks up the book if they follow the rules. So once that's all done, then you go into photography. And each recipe, you know, I always take my own pictures while I'm going. And that Scrivener has a wonderful system where you can pop the photo right into the 
program. So when I get to the photo shoot, we open up the program, we look at the photo I took, have a discussion with the photographers about what's the best look, and then we have to think about the order. Um, in Pi Squared, every single recipe was made in a 9 by 13 quarter sheet pan and was basically brown because it was pie. Mm -hmm. And so we had to think about how do we make 100 pies look different when they're basically all look the same. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. And I don't know that when you pick up a book, you necessarily understand that offhand. But I think that uh, a person's reaction to the book is probably a result of how much time is spent in each of those. And I love cookbooks, but I've noticed increasingly I find more errors in them. And is that just trying to put out too many recipes too quickly, not what having kind of errors? So some are conversion errors, like on page five, it'll say five ounces is 20 grams. And on the next page, you'll say five ounces is 50 grams. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really good with conversions in my head or any of that, but I know that uh, somewhere along the way. Yeah. So do you go with the ounces or do you go with the grams? Yeah. And those are, that's one big thing I've noticed. Well, I would say, I mean, that's really on the publisher because I will turn in the best version of my manuscript, but then there's a, and so then my editor will get it and we go back and forth on style and the words and um, the order of things and uh, and they might, you know, do like your high school English teacher and really go through with a red pen. But the copy editor is the one who looks for consistency. So mm. it's the copy editor who will pull up every time that you say a quarter cup of chopped parsley. And in every place does it always say that that's, you know, 28 grams. Uh, does it always say chopped parsley or does it sometimes say flat leaf parsley comma chopped? Mm. So those so that's a copy of, editor. That is a copy editor job. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's some variations because it's food. You know, I, I found a recipe where it was something with a grilled zucchini and it said grill the zucchini for five minutes until it's soft and done. But I had a bigger zucchini. You know, zucchini has so many different sizes and I think... I, being a chef, know how to adjust, but I'm sure that's very hard if you're selling mm -hmm. a cookbook to the general public, because yeah. if I pulled that zucchini off in five minutes, there was no way. And I guess that's some of the stuff that's not controllable. But well, it just gets so... No, I, I mean, think it is. I mean, if I were doing that, I would say one medium zucchini sliced one half inch thick. Mm. And then if you had a large zucchini, you would still slice it half an inch thick, and it would still cook in the same amount of time. Okay. So you see, I think that's sloppy. Yeah, because it, it, <laughs> it, it took me 20 minutes to cook it to the point mm -hmm. that I felt like it should be. And I feel like if anyone made that and it was five minutes, it wouldn't right. have come out the way that... Well, I think that you may find more cookbooks have those sorts of errors in them, and um, I just don't find it acceptable. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think they should. That's, that's our job. Um, and I look at a manuscript, it goes into the, ed, uh, to the editor in my format, and I might look at it 15 more times before it goes to the publisher. And every time I'm going to read it all the way through and carefully. And it's hard. If you've written it and you've read it 15 times, sometimes you know the words too well. But, um, you know, it's a team effort. And I'm sure it's interesting because you are a recipe writer and developer, but now you're seeing all these chef-driven cookbooks and who's writing those? You know, a chef isn't necessarily Cook best suited writers. best suited for writing a Chefs cookbook. Chefs aren't so, writing them. Yeah. Ever, really. So are they turning in, I mean, I don't Just know. Ghost writers or um, recipe developers or writers. So a chef would just hand them their recipe or talk about the ideas and then together. the ghost writer has to put job. it together. I mean, you, you, sp you hang out with someone in their kitchen, you take their you know, restaurant recipes that make maybe 50, uh, that'll serve 50, you've got to get it down to serving six, but it's not just math, because like that zucchini, if you're cooking a pork roast, let's say, in a restaurant you might get a giant, like a really big loin roast, but at home you're going to get a small piece, and so it's going to cook differently. And so that partnership between the writer and the chef is about learning to speak in their voice and cook in their style, but do it in the home cook's kitchen. Because the, the stove is going to be different. 
you know, in the restaurant, you turn it on high, and man, that stuff cooks in a, in a nanosecond. But at home, if you want to boil something, it takes a while to get it to boil on a home cook stove. So it's a real partnership. Chefs, uh, very rarely are they writing their own books. Occasionally, but usually they need a, a writer in there. A little bit of help. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe that some of the errors that you're seeing in newer cookbooks might have to do with like some of the... You know, it's like a lot easier now to self-publish and, and people probably editing their own books. You can literally just talk and make a book and get it transcribed <laughs> right. into words. You know? There are a so. lot of books that come out. I mean, I think some of the problems that we see are just because of the volume. I know that when Pi Squared came out in 2017, 18, <laughs> um, there were 93 books that came out that day, cookbooks. Wow. Uh, so uh, there's a flood of cookbooks, and there are not enough editors, maybe? I don't know. Is there a reason that they all come out in October, or is it for the pre-Christmas Christmas. rush? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I always think of October as, like, oh, there's going to be 40 books out that I want to get. Yeah, that's just the way it is. They, September, October tend to be the bigger months. Uh, people come home from their summers. They're ready to sort of dig in. School is starting. They want to cook good food. They're looking forward to cooking for the holidays and then for purchasing for gifts. Mm. A cookbook is a great gift. Mm-hmm. Especially Pie Squared or When Pies Fly. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> the plug. Um, so I'm really curious, like, where, where was this breaking point um, that made you want to decide, like, I'm going to write a cookbook oh um so i was a landscape designer which was my second career that i took on when my husband and i got married in the year 2000 i decided to go back to graduate school in landscape design and i became a landscape designer and i had a really nice little business going for about eight years and then in 2008 the economy collapsed and all of my clients just you know their landscape money um, suddenly became their kids' college money. Mm-hmm. And so I just lost my work. And at the time, I was in a women's group, and we were all about 50, and we were trying to figure out what was next. Everybody was struggling. Uh, some women, their kids had gone off to college. They were empty nesters, and others were struggling with marriage issues or career issues. And for me, I was just out of work. And I said to them, I have no idea what to do with myself. I'm not ready to stop working. And each of them told me that I should start teaching cooking classes because I had taught all of them how to cook and I'd been the one who brought stuff to the get-togethers. I've just been known as a cook mm-hmm. all my life. And I, I laughed and said, well, yeah, great idea. Who's, who's going to come and how will they ever find out that I'm holding classes? And... Um, my friends all encouraged me to start a blog, and honest to God, I didn't even know what they were. I had never read one. Um, it wasn't part of my life to be on the computer like that. I was out planting flowers. Mm. So one was a graphic designer, and she set me up, and I just started writing and plugging things in and talking about recipes and thinking nobody was reading it, but a few people were. Mm. And as it turned out, one of the people that was reading it was Bonnie Benwick of the Washington Post. And... When I entered a pie contest um, that September, I won. She was the judge, and she asked me who I was, and I told her, and she said, oh, I've been looking for you. Because I, I just wasn't even part of the food community. I was just a home cook mm-hmm. and uh, you know, writing a few things on my computer. And so Bonnie gave me an opportunity um, that year to have some cookie recipes in the Washington Post cookie section. And then the following year, I started a blogger challenge called Palooza to teach people how to make charcuterie at home. And that went for a year, and I got a lot of like recognition for that. And that December, the New York Times editor of the food section, Susan Edgerly, asked me to start writing a canning column for the Times. So I had kind of gone from zero to 60. I mean, I literally had never written anything in my life, and now my first paid gig was 
for the New York Times. It was a little mind-blowing. And I, I had a great experience there for a couple of years, and Bonnie the whole time was not real happy. It's just like, you live in D.C., why are you writing for those people? And eventually they lured me back, and I've been writing for The Post now for eight years. But it was through uh, other people telling me that I knew what I was doing, because uh, I didn't think I did. Yeah. But I, I was evidently a good writer. And, um, and so once I had the platform of the Times and some magazines and my blog and Charcuta Palooza, I got an agent and then started working on the book proposal that took a very long time for the first one. That's a really awesome story. Oh, um, you never know what mm-hmm. life is going to hand you. Yeah, right? Curveballs. So I assume you had a lot of rest. Did you develop recipes for yourself as a home cook a lot before? Yeah, I never called it that. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you were in the um, habit of writing down your recipes and uh-huh. keeping a, really I think awesome. some of it had happened. I got married and my husband was a vegetarian and I really had never cooked that much vegetarian food, although I love vegetables and I like eating that way. I, it was not the way that I would plan a meal. Mm-hmm. And so once we were together, I had to start thinking in an entirely different way about cooking. And so I remember the first thing I, I ever invented because of him was bolognese sauce where I ground the mushrooms like you would grind meat and then treated mushrooms just like ground beef. And did all the same things that you would do to make classic bolognese. And so I guess that, I was like, wow, I invented that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but that's basically it. And even to this day, while I have a very extensive cookbook collection, if I want to learn to make something, I will read all that I can about it, but then I go in the kitchen and figure it out on my mm-hmm. own. I, I'm similar in that way. I just like to experiment. Yeah, I do too, and I'm not afraid of what my, a failure might look like. You yeah. know, it might look like pizza for dinner. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing right? wrong with that. <laughs> so, um, where did that? Where do you think that came from? Was there somebody early in life that kind of left their mark on you as far as like oh, being a cook? Yeah, I, uh, my mom and I used to watch Julia Child together, and we would cook together. My grandmother and I cooked together. My great grandmother. Her, one of her sons was a farmer, and I used to go, I was kind of an indentured servant in the summers, and I would be helping her preserve all of the things that he grew from the time I was very young, like four or five years old. So cooking wasn't something that I was like, I think now they have people that say, oh, my daughter's going in the kitchen with her grandmother, and it's like fun times. I was in there to work. I was yeah. in there washing dishes and, you know, crack the eggs and measure the flour, and it was, I was helping. I am curious, you mentioned it before in the proposal writing about marketing. Yes. So I'm kind of curious at how, what kind of strategy you use as a writer to market yourself um, and and what would you propose to a a company for that? Well, my first career was in marketing, so that gives me a little bit of a leg up. I do at least have a sense of what works and what doesn't uh, in some worlds. Publishing is a is a very strange world indeed. I mean, I don't always understand it. The traditional trajectory has always been book touring, which actually doesn't, I don't think that moves the needle very much, Uh, but it's a wonderful thing to do. It's great to visit with independent bookstores, give them uh, my support, bring in some of my readers into their shops. I get to visit with friends around the country. I mean, there are a lot of reasons for me to go around. But that's not what moves it. I think I've been spending most of my energy and resources on social media. That is where you make a name, where people get uh, accustomed to what you do, learn to ask questions, you interact with your reader. So uh, that's where I invest, is social media. How many of your recipes do you share? Is there kind of an average if you put out a book? Are you sharing the recipes from the book? My as far as a publisher bl- will uh, call a handful. And I think in the pie books we had seven or eight that were on the publisher's website and that were then made available through uh, links through my social media. And those are also the recipes that are made available to media outlets and bloggers if they want you know they'll get a free book and then they'll run a recipe but once the book's out 
there's no there's no holding the recipe as your own and recipes aren't copyrightable yeah. so there you go on that note so does that mean it's okay for someone to republish as long as they give you credit like could i take one of your recipes from your book post on my website and say this came from her book what's the ethics and even legal standing on that you should go to the publisher and ask for the publisher's permission and then at the bottom you'll see things that say like reprinted with permission Um, that's the thing to do Uh, do people always do that no because sometimes I'll I'll make significant changes and I won't even give the base recipe so I'll say I made this hot sauce based on Sean Brock's hot sauce. So buy his cookbook, find his recipe, and then switch the you know chipotle to something else. But because I've never felt comfortable publishing that recipe, and it seems right. like it would be a lot of work to contact someone to say, "Could I publish that recipe and then give my own changes?" It's pretty easy. I mean, there's an email address somewhere in every book that'll get you back to the publishers, um, and you just write to publicity. And, and I've never seen them say no. They might have an embargo. Like if the book is coming out, my book came out September 17th, they would send the advanced copies but embargo any recipes until publication date. But, uh, you know, they're very willing. Everybody's happy for the publicity. It's free. It's easy. But yeah. nobody feels good about people lifting your recipe without yeah. attribution. I think a lot of times, like, contacting people, like a publishing company... It's just an intimidating thing, but we tend to like say no for people a lot, you know, Mm -hmm. like before they tell us no, I do it all the time. So that's just what I thought of. Well, social, uh, let me go back to social media. I I mean, social, I've been in and on social media since the moment I started blogging. Mm -hmm. I I was already kind of dabbling. I, I like social media for somebody who works alone at home. Social media is like the water cooler. Okay, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go on Facebook. I'm going to see who's around and have a conversation. I can waste some time. We're always looking <laughs> for that. And, and it's in the 10 years since I've been on Twitter and everywhere else, it's certainly changed. I mean, Twitter is, a, is an angry place. Uh, Facebook is, uh, you know, sending me um, messages that I don't want to receive from foreign countries. And then there's Instagram. And I think Instagram is where a lot of people are migrating because it seems um, friendlier uh, and it's pretty. But I'm, I'm still a big fan of Twitter. I, that's how I found you. You know, I moved to Maryland in 2007 and didn't know anyone. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to kind of connect with the D.C. food community and just find out who was there. I tell everyone filters are your friends. I don't think people, it takes time, but like going mm-hmm. into Twitter and muting words, I think I have 200 muted words. Like if you don't want to hear <laughs> anything about the president, you can mute the words right. president. You can, you, and just unfollow and say like, show less like this. Mm-hmm. So that I've really curated a feed still of just the people and the topics that I want to see, because mm-hmm. I think there's still a lot of people out there who you can connect with and have great conversations with. And if you can just kind of get around all the other noise that you yeah. don't want. Uh, but I loved it. And all these people who now I'm friends with in the DC food community, it came from, you know, 10 years ago of being on Twitter where I thought yeah. it was such a great place. Cause you can interact better than Instagram. That's true. I mean, mm-hmm. you can still interact on Instagram, but I, Andrew posts a photo of pizza. I might say, Oh, that looks delicious. And he might come back, come back and say, thanks, but you're not having these conversations that go over the course of a couple days right. the same way you would on Twitter. So I still love it. This might be a generational thing, but I find that Facebook seems like an angrier place to me. Does it? Twitter. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like for people my age, I, I like... Mine is filled with puppy dogs and people doing goat yoga. Okay. <laughs> it's very happy. I see a little bit of that, but it actually makes a lot more sense. Um, what do you think that people are most like angry about on Twitter? Well, don't get me going there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk pie. <laughs> okay. We can keep it there. I guess when I asked, I was thinking in the scope of food and, and Oh, I and see. Cookbooks. I mean, I think there have been some really interesting conversations about ageism, about certainly I can point to people who have opened up the conversation in, about inclusion and uh, getting more African-American and people of color in leadership positions in the writing community mm-hmm. where they haven't been recognized for a long time. And it's really nice to see how, and I think Twitter had a lot to do with moving the needle mm-hmm. um, in that and getting more people recognized and noticed. And I'm seeing more bylines. And that's really fantastic. It was, you know, food 
The food pages in newspapers were um, all women for the longest time. It was just where they would put the lady journalists, and mm. uh, you know, because it was ad pages. And then it became a place for white men for a long time. And now their things are shifting, and I think it's a good thing. Yeah, this is actually uh, makes me think of something I saw maybe like a day or two ago. That's a little broader, but um, it said representation doesn't something along the lines of like representation doesn't mean anything without community building. So, to right. me, the way I take that is that you know you can have representation in those areas, but it it's not going to last, or it's not really doing anything if the people that follow aren't being taught or yes. you know they mm-hmm. just if you have something just to look at it's not the same as, as oh, that i guess that's another version of walk the walk yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> so when you wrote your first book there was social media it was like yes. 2009 eight. Eight. Oh, well no the book i guess is 2013 so yes yeah, so oh, okay it came out in 2013 mm-hmm. and it was through social media that i became known as the preserving person like oh. everybody all summer would be hey help i'm i got tomatoes what do i do or does this look okay and people would send me photographs and it was like preserving 411 <laughs> that was what and and now i'm pie 411 you, know, you got to be useful and that was yeah. how i became useful Absolutely. I still answer those questions all the time on every platform. All all summer, I get these like, "What do I do with these? You know, fifteen pounds of blueberries that my kids picked." That sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. That I mean, that kind of communication like keeps you very relevant. You know, like if mm-hmm. you didn't do that, well, people for me, would stop it's, it's really joyful to yeah. find people who are. It's like, I've made this recipe and it's so good and can I do it with plums instead? And, you know, that I can be there and have that exchange makes writing really much more fun. And going back, that's what I love about Twitter. And I would say like the people at Serious Eats, both Kenji and, you know, Stella Parks, I'm amazed how much time they spend on the internet answering people's questions. Right. And you can just post a photo of something that worked or didn't work or just say, hey, I'm making a cherry pie and it's watery, what would you do? Mm -hmm. I just think it's awesome that these people take the time, probably too much time uh, doing all that. I know Kenji's backed off a lot, but but then that really makes me want to use their recipes Mm -hmm. and be the go-to because I feel like they're invested in... But I think every writer is. Honestly, that we can't do this job without being invested in that kind of conversation. We're obligated, whether obviously or some sort of sub rosa expectation but we have to be out there you're not going to get work what do you think about people that use social media as like their own platform to be a food critic (laughs) (laughs) oh well (laughs) and when i say critic i mean like it i've seen a couple people there's this guy in the pizza world he doesn't just review about pizza he's a writer too he's a mathematician uh, but on the side, it seems like his main focus is like just being super critical of things that it seems like he might not know that much about. Yeah. Well, all you can do is hope that they don't really have that big a platform. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like they're doing it to, to get a platform. Probably. You oh, know, man. when I first really became busy on social media, the watchword was authenticity. That's what everybody talked about. Like, you're going to get caught if you're not authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. And I've always just played it real. And I personally, I mean, I can think of several well-known social media people who are not at all like that when you actually meet them. And Mm -hmm. I find it really disconcerting. I want authenticity in my interactions on social I find that even on a local level with like people that that I've seen on social media and then I meet them in person and spend some time with them and they're like this bubbly, super happy person on social media and then right. <laughs> meet them and they're just like, yeah, so kind of boring. Right. So how long are you going to keep doing pies? Is there something? Oh, I'm on to something else. You're on to something else already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I spent um, three solid years on pies and I... I'm sure I could come up with another book on pies, but I've done my pie book. And so I'm, I'm working on another proposal. I just, before I came here, worked on the last round of edits with my agent and 
I expect it'll go out in the next week or so. So we'll see what happens. So are you always giving pies to people? How's that work when you're developing recipes? Because if you're making a, (laughs) you know, traditional dinner cookbook, chicken, I'm sure you and your family can eat it, you and your husband. But when you're making pies, that seems like a big old thing you've got. I made um, 197 pies and pie squared. And I think when pies fly, we actually counted 800 pies that were made. And I lived at the time in a condo. And that was the best thing, is that I could put out on email and say, you know, there are three pies going to the mailroom. And I would hear people's feet running down the stairs. And I, I got to be, you know, pretty well known. But that was that was good. My recipe developer, she made just as many pies as I did. And she lives up in Brunswick, Maine, um, right off the campus of Bowdoin. And there was a house next door, rented house, filled with rugby players. And so... They ate pie, a lot of pie. But even they, toward the end, are like, okay, enough pie now. <laughs> enough pie, moving on. It's my favorite dessert. Well, savory pies are really my favorite. Yes. And just savory pastries. I, yes. I know it's a pie pastry, so. But yeah, I love savory pastries. Part of the reason why I love Deb so much. Yeah. She's Shout great. out to Deb. <laughs> Deb's Artisan Bakehouse in Middletown. So I've been wanting to ask this for since we first started talking, but writing for a paper, what's that like? Is there like a lot of edits you have to go through? I mean, it depends who your editor is and yeah. who and how you write and all of that. You just never know if you're going to have a lot of edits. Some mm-hmm. some of my things slide through really nicely, yeah. um, and others, you know, get the hammer. Because I write once a month, I'm not on a daily deadline in the mm-hmm. same way. So I get my deadlines well in advance. I have a couple of weeks to develop a recipe. and uh, But you know, sometimes I'll get my things in and my editor's so busy that I don't hear from them until I have an hour and it's got to get done. And that's it. So, you know, get me rewrite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do they ever turn it, like what types of things would they turn it down for, I guess? Yeah, they don't ever turn it down, but they might hate the lead. You know, oh, yeah, or yeah. something like that, or find some word just doesn't work for them. Or do you? So you and you come up with new recipes for any article you do once a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is really fun. This week, um, I think actually today is the tenth, right? On the twelfth, um, the post will run a recipe that I did for a cheesy cauliflower soup that's got beer, so it's kind of like a rare bit soup. It's really delicious. Um, last month I did a homemade turkey breakfast sausage. That was really good. And so, yeah, it's fun things. December was nougat candy. You just mm. never know what I'm coming up with. It's Anything, usually right? pegged to the season to a little bit or something that's um, just becoming interesting to me. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm always experimenting and making food. Do you get to, like, plug your books in in any of your articles is that like a no no it is it's yeah. kind of like that chinese wall between advertising and editorial mm-hmm. um they do put a nice little squib at the bottom that says you know that i'm a local cookbook author with these mm-hmm. books out beyond Can't just that, keep mentioning it no <laughs> it's shameless <laughs> plugs in all your articles no it's really it's really kind of gross to yeah. do that <laughs> So I'm going to ask you some questions. Just okay. answer them as fast as you can. All right. And then at the end, we have a couple ones that aren't really quick answers, but they're fine. <laughs> All right. So. I'm sticking with it. What is your favorite tool in the kitchen? Uh, my uh, KA stand mixer, KitchenAid stand mixer. Uh, who's your favorite chef? Does not have to be a celebrity. Um, locally, I just went to Tarver King's restaurant, the restaurant at Patamac Farm. He's got my vote right now. Man, that was good. I've heard a lot of good things. About really that. good. Art or science? Art. If you got a ticket to go anywhere in the world on a food tour, where is it? Paris. What is your biggest strength? Um, pie. <laughs> yeah, is pie my biggest strength? I don't know. I think it's probably a personal connection. That's a good one to have. Um, what's one thing that you do differently from everybody else? In the kitchen? Anywhere. Wow. I don't, I don't know. Probably uh, I spend more time alone than most people. How's that? That works for me. I love alone time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you say that you need the most help with? Organization uh, in my books. I, I, I always have all these great ideas, but they kind of land in one big bowl. 
and I, I desperately need an editor to help me get the paragraphs in the right order or the chapters in the right order or anything else. I mean, the ideas are there, but it doesn't always come out in an organized fashion. Yeah. As you were saying before, it kind of takes a tribe to write a book, right? Right. <laughs> uh, so, do you have restaurant dreams, or I guess in your case, pie shop dreams? Not a single one. No. <laughs> Could you recommend I'm a writer. <laughs> Being a writer, could you recommend a book to our guests? Oh, uh, I just read a great novel called The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. It was fantastic. We'll link that in the show notes. Uh, what is your favorite culinary resource? The Flavor Bible. That's a popular one. We get that a lot. It's great. It's really uh, inspirational. Mm-hmm. Do you find that you use that more on like the savory side or sweet or both? Both. I used it a lot when I was developing jam recipes. Mm. As I w- might say, okay, I've got a basket of plums. What goes with that? What flavors? And it always led me down some interesting path. Very cool. How do you decompress? Knit. Cool. What's your favorite thing to knit? Oh, I, uh, I make a lot of socks. <laughs> I feel like everybody does scarves and hats, so that's no, the best I make thing. socks. I love socks. Okay, so these are our next two. Uh, these are the long fly questions. Okay. Uh, what's the best meal you've ever had? Uh, my 50th birthday in Paris, I went to L'Ambrasie, which means ambrosia, and it was the truffle dinner, and they served poulet bresse with thin slices of truffle under the breast uh, skin. It was really extraordinary. Mm. And finally, what do you want to be remembered for? <laughs> my pies <laughs> <laughs> I love it simple easy well that's it thank you so much for joining us today it's been a pleasure thank you a lot of talking fun talking with you let everybody know uh, where they can find you I guess on social media or yeah, a way Kathy, to reach out yeah C-A-T-H-Y Barrow B-A-R-R-O-W I'm everywhere under that name awesome and we are the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast you know where to find us leave a comment subscribe review do all that good stuff if you have any suggestions comments or questions email us at chefs without restaurants at gmail.com and that's it that's all folks peace wow. out thanks for listening to the chefs without restaurants podcast and if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show please let us know we can be reached at chefs without restaurants at gmail.com thanks so much